Chapter 36, A Strong Little Thing. Rondelman sat on the stone floor and continued his conversation with Apple, who slumped on the window ledge in the turret. You remind me of myself when I was much younger, said Rondelman. I used to sit all slumped like that. I was always tired. Of course, I was thinner, much thinner than you. You look roundish, like your name, Apple. I once looked like a carrot that has been harvested too soon. Very, very thin. When I was little, I didn't know that in the village they called me the sickly prince. Nobody outside the castle knew my real name. I always wore a blanket over my shoulders, the same gray blanket. And my mother sang to me every day. I miss listening to her sing, but I'm glad the sickness went away and I'm glad I can run. Not today, for there's no place to run in the castle, but someday I will run again as fast as I can. I will run with Mirabelle along the lake. Being stuck in the castle reminds me of all the years I was ill, but I'm glad I'm no longer the sickly prince. Rondouin lifted Apple, and tossing Apple into the air, he, for the first time, made the forever sign with something heavier than a piece of silk. Apple and Rondouin practiced for many minutes. Then Rondouin smiled, placed Apple back on the window ledge, and looked again at Barn Hill, which showed no sign of a signal fire. Mirabelle, standing inside the top floor of the bell tower, looked through the wooden slats across the fields at Barn Hill. She saw no sign of a signal fire. She saw the tall pine forest that hid the barn. This forest stood above the empty horse stable that sat at the spot where the hill met the vast fields. Between the village and Barn Hill and the castle, Mirabel saw fields that would normally be planted by now, still mostly underwater. Scanning the vast fields, Mirabel counted out loud, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven little islands have appeared in the floodwaters. Now a gray pigeon with a flash of green at its neck fluttered in through the slats. Its fluttering wing sounds echoed throughout the tower as it landed near the great iron bell. Mirabelle reached into her pocket and pulled out a chunk of bread. Some for me and some for you, little bird she said, tearing off little crumbs and tossing them toward the pigeon. After eating her bread, Mirabelle returned to the view of the castle, the fields, Barn Hill, and the foothills. Just then, the pigeon flew out. Goodbye, she said, watching the gray bird speed away in the direction of Barn Hill. Maybe you will fly all the way to the barn. And by the end of the morning, I will know whether I too will run as fast as I can to Barn Hill. Roland awoke next to Giselle's head. Next to him was a cup of cold tea he had been too tired to drink. He stood up gingerly, leaning on the wall to support his sore back. He had finally napped briefly after being awake most of the night, waiting for the calf to be born. Roland carefully stretched, twisting slowly at his waist, side to side to loosen his back. It had been a long night on the hard floor next to Giselle. Once he could bend down, he grasped the cup in his hand and drank the cold tea in one gulp. Now Roland turned to the floor to be at Giselle's side, stroking her belly. He said, look what happened while I slept, Giselle. Finally, after so many hours, you are ready to give birth. She moaned again and lifted her head to look at him. Dear Giselle, I am here to help, he said. He firmly pushed the calf into the birthing position. There you go, little one. He moved closer to Giselle's head and whispered, Soon you will meet your new calf. It's not often that a cow needs help to give birth. But over my many years in this barn, I've helped a few. It won't be long now. Roland pulled one last time, and the calf slid onto the straw. Giselle licked the new calf to dry him off. Oh-ho! There you go! Roland clapped happily, 
when the calf quickly learned how to stand on wobbly legs. Now Roland stood too. You look to be a strong little thing, he said to the calf. And you, Giselle, you are tired now. You labored for many hours to give birth, the longest I have ever seen. But you are strong like your calf. You can rest until the sun is almost overhead. Then we must light our signal fire and walk slowly to the good green grass. Giselle seemed to understand this, for suddenly she stood. Her calf nuzzled up to her and began to suckle. Roland smiled. Now I will prepare for our journey. Roland unlatched the heavy barn doors and let the cows push them open. He walked around the barn and lowered the bucket down to the deep well. Once it filled, he quickly pulled the bucket back up. He was so tired that he didn't notice that it was spinning and swaying until it was nearly at the top. The bucket's edge caught on a rock and tipped, spilling half the water back down the well. Roland sighed deeply. Oh, I'm too tired to do even a simple job properly he thought. He pulled the bucket up the rest of the way and lifted the remaining water to his lips. After taking a long drink, Roland set the bucket on the rock wall of the well. Roland cupped his hands and dipped them into the water. Then he splashed the water on his face and gently rubbed away the dirt and sweat from his night on the barn floor. Then he lowered the bucket down the well again and with care pulled it up and poured the water into a jug, which he carried to the kitchen. Roland set to work tidying up the remaining food in the larder. He swept up the floor and wiped down the work table. He worked mostly with his right hand and leaned on the table with his left hand to support his tender back. He poured the last of the water into the half barrel to rinse out the last of the whey left over from cheese making. As Roland lifted the heavy barrel to empty it outside the door, the sharp pain again stabbed through his back. He set the basin back down and bent over the table, leaning heavily on both hands. When he recovered from the jolt of pain, he looked down at the supplies on the table that still needed to be packed he looked beyond the table at the heavy stone slab on the floor, trapping the rest of the supplies he needed in the room below. I'll come back to move the stone when my pain calms down, he thought. Roland walked around the barn, leaning against the wall as he walked. He opened the horse pen. Galen cocked his head and nuzzled Roland's outstretched hand. I'm moving slowly today said Roland to the horse. Go ahead and see what you can find to eat before we pack for our journey. I will check on Giselle. When Roland rounded the entrance to the barn, he found the new calf timidly poking his nose out of the barn door. Giselle was lying down again. Roland stroked the calf's forehead as he passed. He leaned against the post nearest Giselle and slid down to his knees. He crawled around the cow, checking how well she was healing from the difficult birth. Pulling the last carrot from his pocket, Roland put it in her mouth before lying down beside her. Well, Giselle, Roland rested his hand on her forehead. We seem to both be very sore and tired. Just a short rest for us, and then we will finish our preparations. Giselle nudged him with her nose and lay her head over his shoulder. Rondouin heard slow footsteps in the hall and jumped to his feet to open the door to let Cook Agnes in the turret. I have stew for you and some bread, she said, setting a bowl and a big slice of bread on the window ledge next to Apple. Thank you, said Rondouin. Has father seen any smoke from the village? Not yet, said Cook Agnes. The sun is not yet overhead. I thought to bring you your food now, for once it is time for us to light the second signal fire, 
you will be too busy to eat. I've been watching Barn Hill, and I have not seen Roland all morning, said Rondwin. I'm not surprised, replied Cook Agnes. Sometimes I know what he's thinking and what he's feeling. What I'm feeling from him now is that he is eager to move the animals to the foothills, but he feels very tired. In the barn, Roland was sound asleep. Chapter 37 Great Peace of Mind Roland, sleeping next to Giselle, dreamed that Agnes stood beside him in the barn. Wake up, she said. Wake up! Roland awakened and, seeing bright light streaming in the door, realized he had fallen asleep accidentally. Thanks for waking me up, Agnes, he said. He looked around and saw that Giselle still slept and that Agnes was not in the barn at all. That was just the message I needed, he said, realizing Agnes had sent a message from afar. Thank you for waking me, Agnes he said, hoping his thought would reach his sister in the castle. Roland watched the sleeping cow. After so many years with so many cows under his care, he could understand much about an animal by looking at it. And now the way Giselle did not even twitch when he touched her told him that she needed much more sleep. Roland took a deep breath and imagined waking the tired cow and leading her to the foothills by rope, having to coax her all the way. He shook his head, knowing that when she arrived, she would be so exhausted that she might be unable to care for her calf. It didn't take long for Roland to know in his heart that Giselle was not ready to make the long trek to the foothills. You will stay here with your calf, Giselle, Roland whispered. Sir Andrew will send runners, and they will tend to you for a few days. As soon as you have caretakers, Galen and I can lead the rest of the cows and the sheep to the foothills. I know you would love the fresh grass in the hills, but sometimes we have to stay home when we would wish to make a journey. You may sleep, Giselle, for we will not light a fire today. Then, Sir Andrew will know to send help. Mirabelle watched the sun move higher and higher in the sky, and as the morning wore on, the gentle breezes blowing through the bell tower grew warmer. Now she heard the door open far below, and then she heard a rumble of footsteps on the wooden steps. Garrick ran all the way up to the highest level. Any smoke from the hill? he asked. Mirabelle took one last look toward Barn Hill and said, No fire at all. It looks like Roland needs help. Garrick smiled and said, Then it's time for me to ring the noon bell. And it's time for me to go to the boat, said Mirabelle. Goodbye, Garrick. Safe journey, said Garrick, stepping toward the bell and taking the rope in both hands. The sound of the bell filled the tower and echoed until Mirabelle reached the ground level. Here, Mirabelle lifted her skirt and hurried through ankle-deep water toward the pier. She did not sink into the mud, for the streets in this part of town were paved with cobblestones. Coming around the corner, she saw the wooden dock that was just tall enough to be above the floodwaters. Next to it, the green boat, already loaded with people and all manner of bags and baskets, rocked gently. Rowan and the baker stood on the dock. She saw a tall man step out of the boat. That must be Lars, she thought. Nearing the boat, she saw the passengers, Sir Andrew and her father, Ellen, who usually worked in the castle, and other adults from the town. She recognized all of them, Helena, Peter, and Katrina and her husband, Warren. Ellen sat in the bow and Rowan and Mirabelle took the next seat in place of Lars. The baker gave them a big push and threw 
the rope into the boat. Mirabelle caught it and rolled it up and tucked it near Ellen's feet. Now the boat had two rowers. Katrina and Rowan each had an oar, for they would need extra power to travel against the current of the river flowing out of the hills. As they moved through the town, people came to their windows and waved, shouting, safe journey, good luck in the hills, fare thee well. All the passengers waved back, except, of course, for the rowers who kept their hands on the oars. As soon as they left the town, they saw smoke behind them, rising into the sky. Yarrick and his father were quick to light the signal fire, said Ellen. Now the queen and the king know we are on our way to the hills, said Sir Andrew. Rondouin heard loud footsteps moving quickly in the hallway. That sounds like the king, said Cook Agnes. Perhaps he has seen the signal fire, said Rondouin. Rondouin threw open the door to see his father nodding and pointing upward as he approached. Rondouin was the first to reach the top of the stairs and step out onto the roof of the turret. He looked out to the hill and saw Roland stepping out of the door of the barn with two new calves following closely behind him. When the king and cook Agnes joined Rondouin, they all saw Roland wave his arms in a big wave. They all waved back at him. Cook Agnes said, he looks well and the new calves look fine. I think he did not like the fire because he needs someone to stay at the barn to care for one of the mother cows. May I light the fire so Roland knows help is on the way? Asked Rondwin. Yes, you may, said the king. You are ready to be responsible for lighting it and tending it. Rondwin started by making a plan. He looked carefully at the piles of wood around the edges of the turret and then used his stick to locate the glowing hot spots in the embers left from the old fire. Remembering how his father had taught him to build a fire, he started by placing the smallest twigs over the hot embers. Next, he piled thin branches, then small logs onto the remains of the old fire. Last, he placed large logs on the heap. Neither the king nor Agnes stepped forward to help Rondouin, and he realized they trusted him to build the fire with no help. Rondouin found bellows leaning against the turret wall. He opened and closed them forcefully, bringing gusts of air to the embers. The embers sent up a small flicker that lit the twigs. The twigs burned and lit the thin branches. By the time his mother joined them, the flames had leaped to the logs. The fire roared loudly, and smoke rose high into the air. Rondouin watched the flames and the smoke rising higher and higher. I think they will see the smoke in the village too, he said to his mother, so they will know that Roland is aware that help is on the way. Rondouin and his parents and Cook Agnes looked across the flooded fields to Barnhill. Roland still stood at the barn door. Look at those poor hungry cows and sheep, said the queen. The hillside is brown and almost grassless, said Cook Agnes. I know Roland must be very concerned about the animals. And yet I am sure he had a good reason not to start walking to the foothills, said the king. Agnes waved at Roland. Roland waved back at his sister. Now he knows that help is on the way, said Agnes. She then turned to Rondouin and continued. So often you have brought messages to Roland for me, she said. I always count on you to run there and back very fast. Today, with this fire, you have again brought a message to my brother, and I thank you. I'm sure it has brought him great peace of mind. 